Today's conversation is brought to you by He Gets Us. How did the world's greatest love story become known as a hate group? That's the question behind He Gets Us, the largest national multimedia campaign to change hearts and minds about Jesus. Reaching over 1 million people daily, He Gets Us now helps connect local churches to the conversation. From discussion guides, Bible reading plans, and even a sermon series, you can now bring He Gets Us and the nationwide conversation to your church. Visit hegetsuspartners.com forward slash NAE to get these free resources. Year after year, there are more people in the world who have never heard the gospel than the year before. That number should keep you up at night. That number, which is about 3 billion, is increasing, increasing year by year. So we are basically not keeping up with population growth. Today's conversation is the podcast of the National Association of Evangelicals. I'm your host, Walter Kim, NAE president. In these conversations, we seek to help evangelicals foster thriving communities and navigate complexity with biblical clarity. We've joined with the Missions Matters podcast to bring you a special guest, Michael O, the Global Executive Director and CEO of the Lausanne Movement. On this podcast, you'll also hear Ted Esler, President of Missio Nexus, and Matthew Ellison, President of 1615, who co-hosts the Mission Matters podcast. Together, we discuss how God is moving around the world, particularly through the global missions movement. Well, it's great to collaborate and co-host this conversation. I'm Walter Kim, president of the National Association of Evangelicals, an association of nearly 40 denominations, thousands of churches, schools, nonprofits uh, here in the United States. We work together to be more effective in our gospel discipleship and witness. The NAE was founded in 1942, and just a few years after its founding, in 1945, the NAE started the Evangelical Foreign Mission Association, which is now called Missio Nexus. Yep, that's right. There's a good bit of history in connection between Missio Nexus and the NAE. I'm Ted Esler, president of Missio Nexus. We're a network representing about 350 or so missionary agencies and their staff and organizations, uh, many churches in businesses that are all focused on the Global Great Commission. And I, along with Matthew Ellison, who's president of 1615, co-host the Mission Matters podcast. Today, Walter and I wanted to do something a little different and have a conversation together with Michael O. Thanks for joining us, Michael, and I've been looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, well, it's great to be on with you all, and I'm so thankful not only for the warm invitation, but I'm excited about this display, practical display of collaboration, which is so much at the heart of the Lausanne movement. You know, I first was introduced to Lausanne, uh, believe it or not, back when I was a field missionary serving in the Balkans in the 90s. Sorry if that dates me a bit. Michael, how did you get connected to Lausanne and come to lead it? Yeah, my my first connection was like many other people, which is that I read about Lausanne as a part of global church history and global mission history. So I was a student at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and I was just really inspired studying about the history and the impact of the Lausanne movement. Uh, I would say in particular, it was fascinating to see how God used Lausanne to help shape global evangelicalism and also global mission. Uh, the shaping of global evangelicalism, uh, I think first and foremost, was, was through the Lausanne Covenant, which really gave the global church an inspiring lens and guide for our biblical faith and our mission in the world. And then I think secondly, really about friendships, through friendships. Soon after my appointment as CEO of Lausanne in 2013, I spent some time with Billy Graham and I asked him a number of questions, including what are you most looking forward to when you go to heaven? So that actually was my my first question to Billy. But the second one was this. Why did you start the Lausanne movement? And Billy said, I traveled the whole world and met so many amazing leaders but I found they didn't know each other. You know, we take for granted 
so many things about our world today that the influencers in the global church know each other, are connected to each other, and some of us even like each other. Lausanne helped shape a strategic global mission strategy for the global church, but the essential fuel for getting it done is trust. So Lausanne helped to bring the leaders of the global church together for friendship and mission. Now, today's global mission strategy and collaborations have been uniquely impacted by the Lausanne movement. And, you know, if you, if you care about unreached people groups or business as mission or diaspora or the powerful combination of the proclamation of the gospel alongside the beautiful display of the gospel, ministering to the poor, the oppressed and the persecuted, then you've, you've been impacted by the Lausanne movement. You know, if you, if you believe that there are a thousand things that we can do together that we couldn't possibly do apart and that we need to accelerate global mission together. And you rejoice when you see global collaborations that have helped to reach 9,000 unreached people groups and translate the Bible into thousands of languages. Then you've been impacted by the Lausanne movement. So that was kind of my own introduction. It was through study and it was through friendships. And I love, I love being a part of this global movement. Michael, I know that Lausanne has been at this for quite some time. I believe it's 50 years and you will be celebrating 50 years here very soon. Yes. I want to know what makes this gathering unique? Again, a lot of history here. What makes this gathering so special? Yeah. Lausanne's passion is to accelerate global mission together. We believe that together is better. So we basically started with a question of how do we, how do we help the global church do the great commission together? And then we decided that there are three critical things toward that end. First of all, what we need to do, how we need to do it and the way to get it done. So first, what, what do we need to do? So I have five kids. And maybe like us, you have a wall in your house where there are a bunch of, of like lines and, and dates next to them, right? Now, all of those lines with all of those dates need to be very important, need to be together in one place. You can't have a line with a date in one place and a line in another place, etc. You, 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 you need, they need to all be together in one place or else you don't know how much your child has actually grown since when. Right. So a baseline is needed. Now, I've over the last years have asked do dozens of global mission CEOs about the Great Commission. How are we doing? How, how far have we come? How much is left? No one had an answer for me. They, they only knew about their own contribution, their own growth chart. We, we need a growth chart for the Great Commission for the global church. We need a baseline of what it looks like to make progress toward the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And that's why as a part of Lausanne 4, we're producing the first ever global report on the state of the Great Commission. So all of you may, and some of you may not remember, like the world of overhead projectors and transparencies, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like you have a you know, a, a, a visual display of the world. And then you have all of these transparencies out there. So these are like scattered on floors in offices all around the world in schools, et cetera. So each of those transparencies, like you lay it on top of the global, the, the, the world, the, the global church, and it shows just a little piece of information, some really important information about the Great Commission. Some of that data is about the sharing of the gospel in certain places. Some of the data is about gaps or opportunities in particular spheres of society. Some of the data is about what we don't know, but what we need to figure out and find out. So what we need to do is to gather all of the best transparencies, find them, bring them together, lay them on top of each other, and get our best picture of the engagement and the gaps in the world today. And then in addition to the quantitative data, there are stories, testimonies all around the world of people, you know, these testimonies need to be known and the insight 
we need to gather from all of them and we need to learn from them. So we will be pulling together all of these pieces, the best of quantitative and qualitative data to produce the global report on the state of the Great Commission. So when Tom Lin, uh, who's probably a friend of all of yours as well, president of InterVarsity, when he heard about this, he said, hallelujah, finally. So then in addition to knowing what we need to do, secondly, we need to know how we need to do it. So a college friend of mine, we had him over in our, in our kitchen and had dinner together when they were visiting. They do Bible translation in Congo. And he heard about an organization, a global organization that was working to translate the Bible in uh, six or eight African languages. And he told me that he kept having a nagging feeling that one of the languages already had a Bible translation. So what do, you, what do you think he did? He looked for it on Amazon and he found it. <laughs> we need to come together and we need to share information. We need to figure out how to do global mission together. Together is better. Amen. So in September, 2024, the global church will gather for the fourth Lausanne Congress, 5,000 from every nation joining in Seoul, South Korea and 5,000 joining for Seoul Virtual uh, will come together to figure out how we can do global mission better. And then lastly, how do we get it done? We need Netflix for global mission. Global mission today is the equivalent of local video stores like the old company Blockbuster. We, we have tens of thousands of local video stores trying to kind of build up their own stores and, and convince people to come into their stores to watch some great videos that they have on their shelves. We can't use a 20th century model to engage with the 21st century world. We need to find a way to bring the best of the global church to all of the global church. We need a global mission platform that is on behalf of the global church to accelerate global mission together. So at Seoul 2024, we'll be launching a meta platform, a platform of platforms that can help us to connect with each other, learn from each other, collaborate together, and respond strategically to the global report on the state of the Great Commission. Lausanne then will do one of the things that we do best, which is to curate people and platforms and theologies and strategies and resources, opportunities, and, and make connections that can help accelerate global mission together. And not only will we be working to develop a Netflix for global mission, the fourth Congress itself will be Netflix-like. So rather than being just a single group that gathers in a single place at a single time for a one-time showing of an amazing movie at a movie theater. Seoul 2024 will be thousands participating from all around the world, both in person and virtually, with an additional hundreds of thousands who will be able to join various parts globally as well. And then all of the connections and resources will become a part of the launching and the ongoing global mission platform for global mission action. So together is better. Michael, you have given us so much to process in um, what is a very informative, but inspiring as well, um, synopsis of the Lausanne movement. Thank you. I want to pull on a, a couple of uh, threads more individually. Um, and that is something that you said about uh, not only the proclamation, but the display of the gospel, holding those two things together was such an important contribution uh, of the Lausanne Covenant back in 1974 and then picked up again in Manila and Cape Town. Um, I've always appreciated that, uh, holding up eternal salvation through Christ alone and the commitment to a holistic gospel expressed in the ways that you've described. How does this vision remain for L4 and how is it specifically being refreshed for the 21st century, for the new generations? Yeah, like you said, this has been one of the kind of the beautiful legacies of the Lausanne movement. I would say we care about two things, the quantitative dimension of global mission and the qualitative dimension of global mission. 
So Matthew 24 says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So we all want as many people in as many places among as many people groups from as many generations to hear and understand and respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. People haven't heard the gospel until they've heard the gospel. Revelation 19 also says something very interesting. It says, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is what? The righteous deeds of the saints. This is the essential qualitative nature of our gospel mission in the world. A part of our mission and a part of our growing as disciples and a part of our learning to obey all that the Lord has commanded us is living out beautifully, powerfully, winsomely, graciously, lovingly, the good news of Jesus. Now, most people tend to lean a bit more to the quantitative side or a bit more to the qualitative side. But in actuality, these, these really are like two pedals of a, of a bicycle. Mm. The, the more beautiful the qualitative expression of the gospel in the world will lead to quantitative growth. That's a great growth strategy. And the spread of the gospel across the world will in turn give more visible expression opportunity for the beautiful and righteous deeds of the saints. That synergy, that beautiful dynamic of, of power and beauty of the quantitative and qualitative, that is, that resonates so strongly with our younger generations in the world today. That's very helpful. And the analogy, the bicycle analogy of the two pedals needing to work uh, in tandem is so incredibly helpful and compelling. Another thread that I want to pull on a little bit is um, this movement building and collaboration. What you're describing is not simply an event, a big event that's happening in Seoul. You're, you're describing a movement and a spirit of this movement is collaboration. I'd like for you to um, expand on that. And then, Ted, I, I also want to pull you into responding to that. I'm curious to hear both from you, Michael, and from you, Ted, about this notion of movement building and collaboration. Yeah, well, let me first comment on collaboration then, and then on movements. Now, we don't dare say it, but the attitude of too many Christian ministries and too many Christian leaders can be summed up in, in four words. I don't need you. You know, we become so self-sufficient, so well-resourced, so self-serving that we've, we've forgotten Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 12 that, you know, we are, we are a body and that the eye cannot say to the hand or the head say to the feet, I don't need you. Those are haunting words when I read that in scripture. These attitudes then lead to actions of isolation and competition, ultimately deceleration of the gospel. Did you know that year after year, there are more people in the world who have never heard the gospel than the year before? So we as the global church and all these different ministries and more, we're kind of like boats in a harbor. We are all trying to make our own contributions. We are decorating our boats. We're bringing people onto our boats and, and we're doing some good things with those people who are coming, coming on. Some of us are kind of looking at the other boats and saying, honestly, our boat's a little bit nicer than theirs. Or actually, we have a lot more people coming onto our boat than, than, than they do. But you know, all the while we are failing to realize that we are stuck in the harbor. We're stuck in the mud. So we need to find a way to, to raise the water that will lift all the boats in the harbor. And then we need to see those boats moving out from the harbor and working together. And that's kind of a little bit of a mind picture of what we're trying to do with Lausanne 4. And then in terms of movement, for Lausanne, obviously, we're super excited about 2024. But ultimately, it's not about 2024. It's about the world in 2050. It's about the world of our, our kids and, and our grandkids. I, 
think in the last years, I've seen so many Christians kind of doing the same head motion and, and, it, and it's this. And, and it's usually accompanied with, with the same words. How did this happen? How did the world suddenly become like this? But, but it didn't just happen. You know, our world today is a result of people and groups who 30 years ago were dreaming about seemingly impossible changes that they longed to see in the world. And for the last 30 years, they've given their blood, sweat, and tears to work together to make their dream a reality. Are we, as the global church, going to just react to the world we're given? The world that others are giving decades of sacrifice and investment and collaboration toward? Or can we help shape the world in 2050? Now, shaping the world in 2050 can't start in 2045. It has to start now. Mm -hmm. And we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to do this now together. And, and that is the power of movement and the power of collaboration. So Ted, how about you? You know, when I think of this question, whether it's collaboration or movement, the thing that sticks out to me the most is the important role that relationship plays in the kingdom. Uh, relationship is just so core, so central uh, to seeing great ministry outcomes. And in the world we live in today, it is not the West to the rest. It's from all peoples to all peoples. Mm -hmm. And an event like what's going to happen in Seoul is an event where people from very, very different parts of the world facing very different mission challenges come in the room together at the same time, or they're virtually on a call together at the same time. And that is what I think fuels good collaboration. I cannot tell you how many things I've heard about that started over a meal at a Missio Nexus event, for example. You know, we met at lunch, never knew each other, had lunch together at the conference, started talking about this issue. Well, now it's its own network or its own organization or ministry. And the power of people just meeting, just talking, just freely sharing the struggles, the successes, whatever it might be. That's really, I think, the fuel for seeing collaboration and for seeing movement happen. So that's what we do at Missio Nexus all the time. And we're thrilled to be able to do it in a more global context because our focus tends to be the church in the U.S. and Canada. So uh, it's just a great opportunity to see more relationship. One of the things I say to Ted a lot is it is such a joy to swing swords with you. And I just mm -hmm. love that visual of partnership and um, thrilled to be a part of the Missio Nexus network. And like Missio Nexus, we're in that general space of mobilization. 1615 really comes alongside local churches. We help them to really clarify their global mission and then to develop endemic vision that really takes into account their unique gifts, talents, and passions as a local body of believers. And then we connect them to missions organizations who have a value proposition and expertise that those churches need. And so we're constantly building bridges between the church and the mission agency. And just on this note of competition or collaboration, I have to say one of the things that is a little frustrating for me in this current time is a message from some orgs, and I certainly won't name them, but that they've figured it out. This is the way that the Great Commission is going to be fulfilled. And, and I, I love what's coming out of this conversation and what the Congress is aiming at, and that is better together. And I, I just think reaching the world is a complex process, of course, supernatural work of a sovereign God, and it calls forth the gifts and talents of every church and every organization, and no one's cornered the market. Um, we all have a contribution to make. So again, just really love that. Michael, uh, you have a unique seat um, with Luzon, and I wonder from your vantage point, how would you assess the current state of world evangelism and how it's evolved over the last few decades? Yeah, I think we can acknowledge and celebrate that there are areas where some great and encouraging progress is being made, as I mentioned, with 
unreached people groups, Bible translation, and also the globalization of mission, which is, which is different from global mission. So the globalization of missions is the increasingly polycentric manner in which global mission is advancing. Like Ted kind of mentioned, it's not just from the West to the East or the North to the South, but from everywhere to everywhere. Today, nearly 70% of the global missionary force is from the majority world. That may shock a lot of people, especially in the West. That's a huge advance for world evangelization. Where we're seeing some deceleration, I think, is in maybe two areas. Number one, as I mentioned before, year after year, there are more people in the world who have never heard the gospel than the year before. That number should keep you up at night. That number, which is about 3 billion, is increasing, increasing year by year. So we are basically not keeping up with population growth. I think a second area of concern for deceleration is that our public witness is hurting our global mission efforts. Now, there's a statement that's sometimes uh, attributed to Gandhi, but it's perhaps well representative of a lot of people's opinions. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. So we, 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 we celebrate progress, but we have to acknowledge that there are areas where, where we are losing ground in this area of public witness and the public spheres. There are areas where rather than acceleration, we're seeing deceleration. So we're losing ground in our public witness in many places around the world. We're losing ground over issues of human sexuality. We're losing ground over issues of integrity and pride. We're losing ground in the educational realm. We're losing ground with the next generation. So we've got to find a way to continue the areas where there is acceleration. And we need to have some honest conversations. We need to have some repentance, revival. Mm. It comes out from a brokenness over areas where we're not being faithful and areas where our character is not in line with the message that we are sharing. Well, Michael, as you look to the next 10 or 15 years and you consider the global church, I've got a question for you. What brings you hope? Well, I would actually bring us back to Matthew 24. And this gospel of the kingdom will be, will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So ultimately, I think we have, we have a biblical confidence. God is doing this. He's going to complete it. I think what we need to wrestle through is that, and honestly, we don't know whether this will happen either in our lifetime or whether we will be faithful in our generation with what God has given us. So we have this biblical glorious confidence and promise, but there are still aspects of our own faithfulness that we need to wrestle through and just long that in the year 2050, our children and grandchildren will look back on our generation and say, thank God, thank God for that generation. Thank God for their faithfulness. Thank God for their friendships. Thank God for the way that they came humbly with repentance before God and, and, and one another and just responded with the best that they could offer in their generation with the challenges that they had to face. And I'll just end actually with, with an encourage, encouraging a little bit of a thin slice stack that I heard recently, which is that those who have little or no access to the gospel, they are 50 times more responsive to the gospel. Okay? Those who have little or no access to the gospel are 50 times more responsive to the gospel. So that means one of two things. So if we continue on our current trajectory, basically the numbers of those who have never heard the gospel will continue to increase because those who have little to no access to the gospel also have the highest fertility rates in the world. That's why we're losing ground in that area. But if we can figure out how to 
work together to share with and show the gospel to those who haven't seen or heard, we can actually be very confident that many will respond with open hearts and arms and lives. They are, and they will be responsive. And Amen. We, can, we can see some of that powerful and beautiful growth of the gospel, like we're seeing in Iran today, for example. That can happen, but that will only happen if we figure out how to do it and do it together. Our guest on today's conversation has been Michael O. We're also joined by Ted Esler, president of Missio Nexus and Matthew Ellison, president of 1615, both who co-host the Mission Matters podcast. I'm Walter Kim, and on behalf of us all, thank you, Michael. The National Association of Evangelicals is where we use influence for good. Today's conversation is one of many ways we help evangelicals foster thriving communities and navigate complexity with biblical clarity. To discover more NAE topics and resources for you and your church, please sign up for our email list and visit our resource hub at nae.org.